Okay, ladies and gents, well, I'm going to make a video here. This is quite possibly going to be one of a series um, on sort of churches and uh, the way they're set up and the way they're run and, and success versus failure. Uh, because, you know, I've been brought up as a Christian. I consider myself a Christian. Now, I know I swear terribly. And what you hear on YouTube videos is probably only a quarter as bad as I am in real life. I admit that is a bit of a failing on my part. But uh, what I'm seeing as time goes on is the fact that People are turning away from church more and more. And I've got a lot of ideas, a dramatic amount of ideas on my observations over my lifetime and, and more particularly in my more recent adult years, um, you know, as, uh, of course, my thought processes have developed further. Um, you know, I've seen social manipulations, group psychology, and the like uh, being involved in these sort of organisations and how things work, but more importantly, how things don't work. Because as time's gone on, I have seen churches just, for all intensive purposes, self-imploding, you know, and... I believe there's numerous reasons for it and there's aspects of church life whereby th there's an attitude out there um, where there's things of the world and there's things of the church and there is a dramatic disconnect between modern day society and Christianity and there is quite an attempt, <laughs> it's not an attempt, it's a damn scapegoat that if a church isn't going successful, it's just because, oh, well, that's things of the world and they're not blah, blah, blah. You know, but I look at, uh, so anyway, we're going to make this this a bit about the talk between the disconnect, well, most of this is going to be, the whole series will be on the disconnect between churches and the average person, how they've failed in management, how they've failed in marketing, um, and some of the other things that they've just used as scapegoat to get out of being as good as they could be. Uh, and I see it all the time, you know, and, and if there's anything, you know, so many times I've seen where things don't work and the first excuse is, and it's, it's just a convenient scapegoat that, oh, that's things of the world. So, you know, we're not like that. Um, so that's just the, the ways of the world and by that they mean you know, moral degradation of society and things like that, and, and that's what the world does. So, so that's why we won't be compatible with it. But realistically, it's like everything in business. Now, I look at many things in the world as being a marketplace, a business of sorts, but not necessarily a standardised business there to make money. You know, this runs right down the line when it comes to dating sites, and, you know, people sort of essentially trying to advertise themselves on their profile. Now, I have seen dating sites with girls with period memes in their profile. I mean, you couldn't be more blasted stupid if you tried. No guy wants to know about this stuff. We don't want to see that on your dating profile. In fact, we don't even want to think about it. But they put it on there. And you think, holy smoke, what are you doing? This is just... Terrible. You shouldn't be doing this if you want success. And there's piles of things in churches where I see that that's the case. And one of the biggest cop-outs that I often see as to why they can't attract more people 
is that, well, these people are all worldly, so they don't get us, so therefore they're, they're disconnected from us. But like everything, it's a market. You've got to be able to come to a customer as a business and present yourself in a way that they will want to buy your product. You have to go on a dating site and present yourself in a way that men will be interested to talk to you or women will be interested to talk to you. And I believe wholeheartedly as a church that you have to be presentable so that people will want to come to church and be interested in learning about God, following your religion and the moral structure that comes with that religion. But so many times there's just a cop out of, oh, well, you know, the world's got to align to us and they've got to have everyone else out there. We don't have to appeal to them. Oh, hell no. No, we don't have to appeal to them. Everybody else out there has to have a light bulb moment and they've got to come in to the church and magically just, you know, they're, they're just going to be get hit with a light bulb moment or, or get smacked on the back of the head with a cricket bat or something and, and have a bit of a poo, bit of one of those sort of moments and, and then sort of just sort of meander their way into church like a dog following a scent. It doesn't work like that. If you want people in the modern world to come into your church, you have to understand what bait people will take. Now, some people are in the market for a washing machine. So when that little pamphlet, that little booklet slips out the bottom of their Sunday newspaper or their Wednesday newspaper or whatever, advertising those glossy machines that have this thing and that thing and the you know the 15 minute wash feature or the whatever it is those steam features that the Bosch ones have and all these other bits and bobs they're going to say gee that's great that looks good and they're going to be able to find a phone number on that pamphlet they shouldn't have to google it they should find an address and a phone number on that pamphlet so that then they can go and have a look at this device and realize if they want to purchase it and, you know, there's a, there's a little bit in a, <laughs> there's a song made on it and there's a part in the Bible that says, you shouldn't hide your light under a bush. And yet you look at all these churches and it's all, well, everybody else is just going to have a light bulb moment and just, you know, somehow come to God and, and all come in here and blah, blah, blah. Um, once again, what's it say? Don't hide your light under a bush. So anyway... What I'm getting at is if you want people to come in to your church, you've got to have something to attract them in. And this is where I always hear the cop out of, oh, well, we shouldn't have to attract people. They should just come to us. Or, oh, well, if they're so involved in the wicked ways of the world, you know, that, that's, we're not going to use worldly methods to attract them. Nobody said you need to have some girl dancing in a bikini to attract people into church. Now, trust me, there's a particular offshoot cult known as the Flirty Fishers that was somewhere in America that was basically based on that sort of bullshit. And believe it or not, they're still going today. A lot of women in it, most of them under the age of 30. Well, well, at least good-looking women, not necessarily under the age of 30, but... And, you know, many people believe that to be a cult uh, because it's sort of used, uh, well, it, it used, you know, sexual enticement to bring men into the church where they would then try and force them to convert within five minutes of being in there. The guys thought they were going in there to, to you know, you know what I'm going to say. Anyway... It's one of these things, you'll never find new converts if you can never understand your customer because for all intensive purposes, marketing and business aside, that's really what you're doing. You're appealing to a customer. Now there are throngs of people out there who have lost themselves in the worldly 
rat race, the run of possessions and debt and credit and instant gratification and more trinkets and fancy machines that you never bloody needed to begin with and all that. There's piles of people out there who are looking for the real meaning of life. So many of them end up uh, <laughs> not finding it and just struggling like shit and some even suicide. And others decide they should go and talk to the Indian guru or have a trip in India or Nepal and, and uh, all this sort of stuff. By the way, any of you who have actually been in Nepal, as one of my mum's friends have, will find it's glorious. Because a couple of years ago, and I don't know if it's still the case, but it was like this a few years ago, they had Maoist rebels up in the mountains. And on top of that, they had a curfew at night. And there were armoured personnel carriers rolling down the street. Really the sort of place that you want to go to with troops on the street, armoured personnel carriers on the ground and rebels in the mountains and a 10pm curfew. Really the sort of place you want to go to to find enlightenment. But, you know, so many people are so bloody clueless that they don't even know that about Nepal. It may have calmed down now. But uh, I'm not saying the, rebel, uh, the Maoist rebels are left, but, you know... They're out there looking for something. And these people who are hungry for an answer will, <laughs> you know, will come to you if you have the answer. But uh, there's sort of this blanket thing of, oh, well, we're just going to be here and we've always been here. And it's almost like one of these businesses that's in denial that it's going bankrupt. You know, there's a guy, one of my sidekicks at work who's since left, um, he was in a business and the boss told him that this business has been going for, it had been handed down to one of the boss's sons and the boss's son was there telling him that this business is never going to fail, it's been here for 30 years. They were bankrupt nine months later. There's a lot of businesses you see that haven't existed for a long time that are usually somebody blowing their entire life savings on an idea and you'll notice that they have this thing of they hate the idea of being, you know, of, of kissing the boss's ass. Well, I got a little news flash for you. Once upon a time when I was about 13 years old, I had a business. And I used to do a bit of basic work around the place and I'd be usually, well, I spent a lot of time cleaning out uh, horse stables, but anyway, in more recent times, 2010, 2011, I had another business. And during that time, although the business ultimately wasn't successful, I had a fairly steep learning curve on business. And during that time, I realised that you never actually get rid of your boss. The customer becomes your new boss. But anyway, you have these people in the newspaper writing this bullshit, like uh, what I used to see, there's a, a guy in a newspaper in the capital and he always used to be writing this stuff on um, you know how you can escape the, the the boss thing and this and that and there was one article he wrote how to jump from work girl Friday into boss Monday and one of the things that was advised in this article I'm not joking you should use credit against the business to pay yourself the salary that you want to get until the business builds up to the salary uh, to produce enough money to give you the salary that you always wanted. Newsflash, unless you go into a loan shark, they don't give you any credit until you've had at least one entire financial year of a business. How do I know this? I went to a commercial vehicles dealer and that's what they told me. As part of finance, we need to see your papers for at least one year of your financial statements for that business. At least one year. Not six months, at least one whole financial year. And so a lot of this stuff was written by a guy who had no bloody clue how basic credit works. And, you know, it's... <laughs> business credit is usually far dearer than personal credit and it's not something you really want to be messing with in case things don't work out. But there's a lot of people that go out there, start these businesses, 
with the idea that they're going to quote unquote get rid of the boss by starting their own business and then they won't have to work for the boss. Well, as I learnt in 2010-2011, it's all a load of bullshit because the customer becomes your new boss. And I'll give an example of another business, you know, and I've, I've heard this phrase several times from people with several failed businesses, and that is that, uh, well, the customer is just going to have to do this, this, and this if they want to have our stuff. Well, guess what? They never had your tacky shit before, and they don't need your tacky stuff now. Not if you're going to sit there imposing sort of rules and slash or complications as to how they're supposed to act and how they're supposed to play ball and all this sort of stuff because it's a competitive market and if you diddle them around too much guess what they ain't coming and guess what if they never needed it before there's quite a chance they don't need it now so they're still not coming one of these things I've seen a business who uh, is up the road from where I am and they've decided that they're going to be a butcher but they've got no actual real shop space so they've decided that instead of being near the main shops like everybody else who's running the legitimate business they're going to set up the business on their farm so you're supposed to drive a quarter mile down their driveway to get there so that obviously didn't work out they had one sign on the front gate and people didn't want to drive a quarter mile down their driveway so now they've spent money on two shipping containers and put them oh, about 50 yards I'd say maybe 60 yards from the front gate they've increased their amount of signs on the front gate from one to about four or five I don't know what they think the idea is of just going from one sign to four or five. I mean, you know, it's, it's the same front gate they're hanging on. It's not really going to, you know, I don't know why they spent so much of an effort putting more signs that say the exact same thing on the same gate. But anyway, they've gone to put these two shipping containers in. And I think they've got like a little glass roller door in the front of one of them or something like that. And, uh, well, they haven't put any cladding on the side. They still look like dirty ass shipping containers. And uh, they decided they needed a bit of modern art or something that looked nice. So what did they do? Did they plant trees around it? Did they put little shrubs in them? No, what they done was they cut down a bunch of dead branches and planted these dead branches no leaves on them just just bare bits of dead branch and planted those you know stuck them in the ground like fence posts all around these two shipping containers I don't know what the appeal is there this is uh, <laughs> pretty typical of these businesses that has failed before they've even started because the same couple decides they want to argue over somebody with a uh, a little sausage and bread stand, a particular organisation, uh, a community group, we'll say, uh, at the local farmers market because they've gone and bought these sausages and they're not actually a part of local produce because they got them from um, the, you know, the local supermarket chain which sources this stuff from probably all over the damn country so you know they arguing the toss about customers that they never had with other people trying to sell a, a couple of snags um, they're uh, obnoxiously got it all worked out that the customer should do what they want the customer to do and needless to say 
Many churches run the same way. We'll stick a little sign up and, uh, you know, the people will just somehow pick up on the scent of a church like a dog smelling a something it wants to eat and smelling, you know, and, and following the scent trail. Um, you got any plans to bring anyone in? Oh, well, we're not going to stoop to their worldly ways and, and you know, the next thing I'm hearing that advertising your church might be sort of, you know, we, we don't want to have any gimmicks to bring anyone in because they should be bought in by, you know, the uh, the power of God himself. Oh, God, Tommy. Once again... You've got to appeal to customers. Customers ain't just going to come running into you. You've got to do something. Advertising, marketing, or something in some way to appeal to these customers. And I don't want to stoop to doing worldly things. It's not going to cut it. You've got no marketing strategy. Well, in fact, some of them do. But it is so entirely bad that they would actually be better not doing it because it actually brings them down further. You know, the common one I see is that they've got this sign and they stick it out the front that just says, you know, outreach or, you know, family fun day or something like this. And it reminds me of the time I was watching Gordon Ramsay and they had one of these restaurants that was on its knees and basically failing fast. And, uh, you know, the guy was in massive debt. And he had like about 15 of these signs that are, they're on core flute, which if you don't know what that is, it's sort of like a, um, it's like what real estate signs are made out of and stuff like that. And it's sort of basically like a, almost like your cardboard that you have boxes made out of, but like a plastic version. And he had all these little core flute signs And he had about 15 of them. And one of them said, now taking reservations. And Gordon Ramsay says to him, why do you got to advertise that you're now taking reservations? He says, oh, well, people might not know if they can have bookings or not, so I thought I'd stick it up. He said, hey, if the food was good, you wouldn't need to put up a sign saying, we're now taking bookings. Because nobody's coming because the food's shit. Putting up signs is not going to do anything. In the end, he grabbed these 15 signs and chucked them in the dumpster. And, you know, it's the same sort of thing. I'll put up a little sign that says Family Fun Day. You know, but everybody knows what you're doing. Everybody knows that, you know, you're just trying to bring them in as members of the church and whatnot. And, you know, sometimes you get people that used to go to church and they'll start, you know, they'll come to that day or whatever and they'll come for another month or two and that's it, they're gone again. You know, there's nothing that's really enticed them enough to stay, you know. And, and that's it. You know, the more sort of churches and, and that, you know, Christianity may not be of worldly things, but if it's not involved in the outer world, it's like a business with no customers. It's just doomed. You know, and I've seen this all playing out, you know, and um, it's unbelievable. I'll tell you a little bit about some other marketing I saw years ago and uh, it was a particular church that wanted to encourage in more teens. So they're, they're sitting there aiming to go, you know, 16-year-old girls and all that, you know, well, come in a church. Well, they had this little song that would have suited five-year-olds and they were dancing on this uh, bus that was a small bus, Japanese-built thing, and uh, they realised that if they all jumped on one side at one point and all jumped on the other side at the other point, the springs in the suspension would rock the bus from side to side. And they thought that was groovy. And they thought that was the best marketing tack they had or they just sort of looked cool, so they went ahead and done it. And honest to God, I think it would have thrilled a few five-year-olds, uh, especially ones who like watching the movies, movie Cars, but uh, if they thought they were going to attract any teenage girls that way or teenage boys, they were absolutely shot in the foot. It's absolute brand-wrecking. You couldn't have had... Any worse a promotion for a church 
other than being on the news with a pedophile in the church. I mean, really. I mean, it was just atrocious. You really wouldn't expect to bring any more people in. In fact, the average teen's going to look at the other teens that were involved in this video and say, what the hell is wrong with these squares, these weirdos, these nerds? Because it really wasn't appealing. If you don't know your customer, you've got no hope in selling to them. And I always get this wailing voice coming in behind me saying, oh, but we don't need to sell to anyone. So do you want this church to go down the drain or don't you? Because if you can't bring people in the door, you're like a, a business that can't bring people in the door. The clock is ticking. It's a matter of time till you're flat on your face. You know, and this is one of these things, you know. You just see their attempts and their attempts are so bad that you just... You just shake your head and you just go, can you not get a sense for the way the rest of everyone else is running, you know? Oh, but we're not part of the world. We're not part of... Yeah, but if you're going to bring people from the world into you, how are you going to do it if you can't understand how they think and appeal to them. Because at the moment I'm looking at this audience, you know, and, and, and a lot of you have seen it, you would have seen it in England, you may see it in parts of the United States, I'm not so sure, you may have your shit together more over there. But I can guarantee you parts of Ireland, parts of England, and Australia, and you'll see this in New Zealand too, the biggest flock that you've got is women in their 70s and their 80s. Now, I'll put it like this. We'll refer to them as the customer base for a minute. If they are your customer base, if they are your flock, they're literally dying. They have a fall, or they break a hip in that fall, or something like that, and they end up in a nursing home, and that's one less. One of them... I don't know, has a issue and, and might have to go in for a hot heart bypass or something like that and they're out of the game. The clock is a ticking and if that's your main base, <laughs> they are literally either going into aged care or dying, literally. And, you know, and if you think, well, that's your main base, well, guess what? The church is dying too. You know, and you sort of, you look at all this and you just think, how can you be this stupid running an organisation and thinking you've got a future? There's like a complete impossibility to step back and view themselves from a third party perspective and see that the ship is sinking really fast, really fast, badly. They've got another tack nowadays where they try and bring in refugees and they teach them English. And of course the books, they've got are children's books about Bible stories. You know, funny thing, I went through all my years and listened to these little Bible stories and all that. And half the time you get to the end of the Bible story and you think, now where was the moral? Once upon a time they used to write a lot of kids' stories and every story was a loaded story because it had a moral behind it. And you know, you hear that Jesus goes to this place and that place and some other place and meets this person and does that and blah, blah, and maybe this thing is part of to do with the verses in this part of the Bible or it's got a bit of a moral. But half the time it's just, you don't really know where it's headed. You're listening about a guy who lived 2,000 years ago in the Middle East who done this and done that and at the end of it you sort of come out with the mind of a child, you, you sort of can't even see where the moral was to it all. And you hear the story and you say, ho-hum, that sounds good. And a lot of people hear this stuff and they get to adulthood and they think, well, okay, you've done this and you done that, but what was it all about? You know, and this is the thing. It, it's just, there's just such a chronic blooming disconnect between what would appeal to people and what they're actually doing. So there you go, that's sort of my little uh, ploy on uh, all of that business. Um, you know, and uh, it's one of those things, you know, if you can't understand 
your customer and you can't understand your market, uh, you, you won't be able to attract anyone. And this whole idea of obnoxiously saying, well, they're part of the world and the worldly ways, well, you're insulting your customers. You're not willing to understand how they think and what motivates them. Uh, so um, what's your plan? Do you even have one that's a, log a logical plan or are you a bit like some of this, this butcher business where it's a plan that suits them? Where it's a plan that, well, the customer's going to do this and do that and, you know, come and drive way out of their way and, and you know, they might have to do a U-turn but drive an extra half a mile to do this U-turn to come in through a front gate that they've probably got to open and then come into a bloody shipping container to buy meat at more than double the price of what I can buy it at the local supermarket. You tell me again why people are supposed to buy that meat? The same thing. Churches have got to look from a third party perspective and ask themselves why people want to go in there. And there's a ready market full of people who are lost, who, you know, are looking for answers in life. And they more often end up in Eastern mysticism and New Age ideas and all that. And the church has been there for years. There's churches that have been here since the 1800s. They live just down the road, but they missed their chance to pick up this person. Another one that I was thinking of that I forgot about five minutes ago, which is why I'm repeating myself a bit, is ISIS. Now you consider ISIS. Here you are with, you know, these people jumping, making a mini bus rock from side to side, and that's supposed to be cool, and that's our way of trying to bring in 16-year-olds, making some video that goes on some unknown YouTube channel that should appeal to a five-year-old, not a 16-year-old. But look at ISIS. It's a religion. I suppose you could say that. Some people say it's a death cult. Some people say it's a terrorist organisation. It may be all three. If you look at ISIS, there they are on your TV screen, decapitating people, you know, doing all this bizarre shit. I've seen a video online where they had a bunch of kids in like a fucking giant rabbit hutch just on the side of the road, just all these kids. I mean, it was in a built-up area. They were all buildings around, but they had like 20 kids in this giant rabbit hutch, all under the age of five, just chucked in this cage. I mean, they were literally caged in. And yet ISIS has used Twitter to lure stacks of teenagers to grab their passport, get on a plane and fly to Syria into a fucking war zone or into Turkey to cross into Syria into a fucking war zone and they've hidden it from their parents and the last footage that the parents have of them alive is walking through airport security ready to board a plane to Turkey. And just using Twitter and apps on Android devices, ISIS can recruit 14, 15, 16 year olds who in one case in the state capital in my state flew over there and three days later they blew themselves up as a suicide bomber. And here we are, not even able to get a teenager to walk in the doors of a church that's a quarter mile or a half mile from where they live. Yet Islamic fundamentalist bunch of nut jobs can convince 14, 15 and 16 year olds to board a plane to a foreign country without telling their parents to go over there to either be sold off into the sex industry as a sex slave, raped, or probably both, 
or end up suicide bombing themselves. Now, when some fucking terrorist death cult can outdo the local church, and they're not even based in the damn country, that starts to show you how incompetent churches have been when it comes to recruiting teenagers. Right there. And of course, there's all the whole string of excuses, and oh, how could you say that? Yeah, well, I'm a great one for red pilling people and just dropping the truth as it is. It's a legitimate, constructive criticism comment. And do they have an answer for it? Oh, we aren't a death cult. I know they're not a death cult. Your average church isn't ISIS. That's obvious. But still, if you're outran by ISIS, there are serious issues that you have in recruiting people. If ISIS can do it from a foreign country using Twitter and you can't do it when they live a quarter mile down the road in the same country. <laughs> they don't need any passport, they don't need any plane tickets, and they sure as hell ain't going to blow themselves up. They don't see any bad news stories about anything that's happened down at the local church, but they see plenty of bad news stories about Syria. And guess what? They're doing a better job of recruiting young people than local churches. And any excuses that local churches have are just lame-ass cop-outs, the same as why this local butcher's business isn't getting any customers. Oh, this one's stealing the business. Oh, that one's stealing our business. Oh, someone else is screwing us up some other way. Forget the cop-outs. Forget the lame excuses and find a solution to the problem because if ISIS can do it, why the hell can't we here in this country do it as Christians? Thank you very much.